bringing another video to you. It's going to be the quick down and dirty. Um, we're in October of 2023, and I'm going to explain why I believe that we are not currently going to experience another 2008 crash. There's a bunch of different reasons. Um, I'm a very much statistics-based guy, so supply and demand. Um, don't really watch the whole the news a whole lot. I follow the data. So we're going to kind of go through some of this. Um, and then from my experience in dealing with buyers and sellers, where the emotion kind of comes in and actually where it can play an impact on the outcome. So let's talk about this. Why it's not a 2008 crash. The loan types. So everyone kind of talks about this. So loan types. When this was in 2008 crash, I was in the business, there was a very different type of commonality among borrowers. These are the differences. The adjustable rate mortgages were extremely common. Um, we don't need to get into the politics on why they were horrible, who pushed them, who's responsible for them. The point is that they existed. A majority of people took them out. Um, maybe not majority, but enough to impact the market the way it did. Um, it was a big deal. So the adjustable rate mortgage essentially is you close on your loan, you have a specific payment, but over time the payment will go up and adjust to the current mortgage or the current interest rates at the time of the adjustment. So we had interest rates in the five, six, seven, eight range and they would slowly adjust over time predicated on how it would work. Interest only. Why that came into play is people, you could buy a house on an interest only loan, meaning you were making no principal payments and then it would adjust at a specific time period, three, five, seven year adjustable, um, to the current interest rate, including the principal payment. So you would have to adjust and they would go up drastically. So if you didn't have an appreciation and you couldn't refinance, that's what would happen. You would have a $1,500 a month payment go to $3,000 a month in a matter of 30 days. So it was pretty substantial, which is what kicked in a lot of the foreclosures. The zero down portion came from a couple of different ones, but there were zero down options. You could literally come in um, and sign a piece of paper and be done. Here's your keys, move on, etc. The 80-20 program was another one where they weren't calling it a zero down program, but that's exactly what it was. You were getting an 80% down uh, mortgage, or I'm sorry, an 80% mortgage for 80% of the value of the purchase price. Then you were piggybacking an additional 20% loan onto the entirety. Both of those were adjustables typically. The 20% uh, had an extremely high interest rate, but it was often interest only, as was the 80-20, so, or 80%. So when those did adjust, it was even worse than a normal arm rate if you arm loan had you put down any money. So that was a lot. And then stated income loans. So we don't really have these anymore. There are some different investor products that you can get into called DSCR, but that's by and large a very minority of the bulk of uh, real estate transactions. The stated income loans at the time were just anyone could walk in. If you could fog a mirror, they were gonna give you a loan. You just said, they basically say, here, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a bartender, how much money do you make? 200,000, and they would just give you the loan. It didn't, you didn't have to prove it. There were no W-2s, bank statements, pay stubs, none of this existed, and if it did, there was a lot of fraud. Those types of situations aren't around anymore. Um, you have sporadic ones, but this was kind of the industry norm at the time. Um, so when those kick in and you have this huge foreclosure gut, glut, um, it creates the market that we had. We don't have those anymore. People are putting heavy down payments down. They're strong borrowers. You have to have a very good interest rate to, or I'm sorry, credit score to get a good interest rate. You have to have a job, provable income, reserves in the bank. These are strong borrowers for the most part that are um, closing. Um, in Arizona specifically, if you don't remember, two, three years ago when we were in kind of the peak season of, uh, of purchasing, get 10, 15, 20 offers in a day on a house, usually the offers that won were cash purchases. What do you foreclose on when it's a cash purchase? Nothing. There is no mortgage. Now, a lot of those, if they were investors, they refinanced, but at the time, the finance rates were 3 to 4%. You're not going to walk away from that. So some of those things aren't even an issue, even if you do expand out and add mortgages on top and debt services. So it's interesting. The other reason why it's not is supply versus demand. This is the offset. If you get high supply, huge foreclosure rates, people walking from their house, short sales, foreclosures, etc. So, huge supply with no demand because mortgages aren't being offered anymore. That was the crash. We had huge supply, no demand, prices decrease. Now, we don't have supply issues. We have very, very drastic drops in supply because we have what I call the golden handcuffs. If you bought at a two and a half to a 4% interest rate, two years ago, two and a half years ago or more, you literally, quite literally can't afford to move. Where are you gonna go? If you upsize, your mortgage payment is likely going to double or more, which you can't afford because you'd have to qualify unless you 
doubled your income over those two years, which is likely, um, or I'm sorry, is, is possible but not likely. Um, so the supply side is remained decreased. You can't afford it. Even if you get in financial straits, let's say you wanted to, uh, you lost your job and you weren't going to be able to make your payment. Are you going to foreclose on your house payment of $1,500 a month and then go rent that same house that you bought two and a half years ago, whose rent is likely at $2,000 or $2,500? So your financial stress to try to overcome that by maybe liquidating the only asset you have with equity is your house. You're going to offset that by paying more in rent. Most people aren't going to do that. You can't afford to. So that's why they're golden handcuffs. I call them golden because it's actually a good thing. If you can keep your two and a half interest, um, three and a half percent interest rate on your mortgage for the entirety of it, the bank is the only one losing. You are gaining substantial equity and wealth. So it's golden handcuffs. So that's what's keeping supply down at the time, at, currently. Um, we've had, and I'll, uh, I'll jump down to the inventory process on why I think supply isn't gonna go anywhere. There's some offsetting, um, uh, opinions about supply increasing due to investor liquidation. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't see a lot of investors um, upside down. Most of them that have the two and a half to three and a half percent interest still have equity. Um, so when you see rental rates dropping, so let's say an investor bought two and a half years ago at three and a half percent interest rate, a mortgage of 1500. Fast forward now rents are 2500 a month. They've been able to increase these over time. So they're profiting a thousand. People have been analyzing this data for the last two years and going, well, rental rates have gone from 2,500 and now they're slowly decreasing. Well, that's true, but you would have to go from 2,500 back to where they were two and a half years ago to 1,500 when they bought the house to even break even, let alone lose money on that asset. So the likelihood that we're going to see that with not a huge increase in supply is very unlikely. I do think rent rates are gonna come down by quite a bit, but not enough to force the sale of an investor transaction. So that's kind of where that's coming from. The demand. So demand is down 100%. Of course, when you go from 3% to 8%, it's gonna fall off a cliff. I mean, we are down to rates, uh, mortgage application rates from like the late 90s, which is obscene. Um, so they're down by quite a bit. It is certainly offset by a decrease in supply, not enough to make up for that decrease in demand, which is why you're seeing a slow decline in valuation of the house. You're not seeing this massive drop off, which you saw in 08. That's why we're not there in my opinion. So you still have them down, but they are steady. So who is buying houses? So you still have relocation people. So you still have people coming from other states. Um, you still have people uh, moving from different areas within the state and, and buying houses that have a lot of equity. So they are selling, they are offsetting um, the new mortgage rates by buying down their new um, mortgage amount. So there are there, you still have forced sales. You're always gonna have, unfortunately, death, divorce, um, forced reloads, job layoffs, et cetera. So those are still happening um, and forcing uh, sales and then demand to increase. And then cash buyers. So you do still have um, retirees, people coming from California that sold 2 million and they're buying 600,000 here um, and have huge chunks of cash. You also have the people that are um, liquidating other assets. So maybe they're selling a business or they're liquidating retirement funds um, because they don't see the, the stock market giving them the same appreciation. Um, and when I say appreciation, that means that if we have an 8% um, mortgage rate, they don't think the interest rate uh, on the stock market is gonna be 8% because why would you offset? So that's where the liquidation is coming from. Um, so buyer mentality and the search progression. This is why I think demand um, will slowly actually increase even though we've kind of had a bump in interest rates. So put yourself in a buyer's perspective. Maybe you've bought before. Um, that mentality, the process of starting to buy a home varies for everybody, but it likely starts anywhere from a year to two years out before the trigger is pulled. So you're either renting, living with your parents, uh, moving to uh, jobs, getting ready to move, et cetera. So that time frame. Usually you're gonna jump on a Zillow, talk to your real estate agent, start looking at houses in your neighborhood, getting bored on a Saturday and going through open houses. That process starts to take place. When that happens, you will slowly, by default, Googling, get inundated with offers for mortgages. So a lot of these guys do drip campaign ads and it'll say, hey, I saw you basically looked at this house for 400,000, your payment is going to be this. So that mentality, why we saw a huge drop off in demand was because the people that started that process when there was a three and a 4% interest rate went to go get a mortgage two and a half years later, two years later, one year later, and their mortgage payment went up $800 and they went, this is ridiculous, I'm not paying this. 
But the, the mentality of someone that started that search a year ago, it was 7%, 6.5%. So the jump up to 8 didn't offset it enough to maybe make the decision to continue to stay to rent. It wasn't as drastic of a jump from their mentality. This is only going to uh, continue as time goes on. So in a year, I don't think interest rates are going to go up to 10%. Um, so it'll offset. So I think demand will actually come back a little bit as that mentality of progression of what you can afford um, doesn't change. And we see that coming likely. Um, I think demand is, is going to stay strong. It's still better than renting. Um, we, if we see huge rental decreases, which I'll come back down in here into what the, could change all of this and why this could get worse. Um, you know, it, there's only thing worse than an 8% interest rate, which is a 100% interest rate, right? That's renting. You're not getting any principal pay down. You're not getting a write-off for interest. You're not getting appreciation in the house. So none of this stuff is happening when you're paying rent. You're basically building the equity for somebody else. So that's supply versus demand. So the builder reaction. Why I think this is different than the 08 crash is builders have a very long-term memory when it comes to reactionary things within the market. Now, we have a short-term memory um, in the midterm, so six months to a year. But if we do get a correction, it doesn't take long for the builder to have a plan, a strategy in place, because it's still in the file folder, on how they could and should have reacted in the 08 crash. So a lot of the executives, decision makers, and things like that are still around, um, still having an influence in the decisions, etc. So I think the builder reaction will, will make a much faster um, adjustment, decrease supply, which offsets some of the depreciation, and we won't see a crash. Um, if you have a... Uh, suggestion or think that's different, please let me know. So distressed liquidations, short sales, foreclosures, modifications, and investors. So all three of these come into it. So from a distressed liquidation standpoint, one of the um, difficult parts of the 08 crash was that it was something we had never experienced in our lifetime. So when foreclosures came about, no one knew how to really process these at the level and amount that it took place. So it took a very long time to get through that. Um, you, I mean, sure, we've all had stories of somebody staying in their house for 18 months before they were kicked out without ever having made a payment. That kind of story, we don't have that anymore. All of these things can now be instituted very quickly. All these um, banks, um, especially the big ones, which has been consolidated um, to the big ones since the crash. A lot of the big uh, middle market banks have gone out of business. So we've seen this consolidation among the big boys, Bank of America, Wells, Chase, etc. cetera. Um, they know how to process these. So if we get into some type of a situation where that happens, a bunch of things can happen. They will absolutely work much easier with people to modify the current loan because they don't want to take the house back. The foreclosure and short sale market is streamlined from that perspective. We don't have to reinstitute or restart these programs um, for them to take time. So that'll happen. And then investors. Um, from the last crash, we have a huge, and I'm sure you guys see this all the time, how uh, the investors on TV, um, the flip this house programs, all of this thing has, has created this huge um, over jump into the real estate market for investors. So even if we do get this distressed assets that come and hit the market, the buyer pool I think will jump up drastically and very quickly. Um, a lot of these guys are waiting in the wind. They have all the business systems in place. Um, they just don't see a reason to buy right now with 80%, 8% rates. But if that changes, those guys will jump right back in, gobble all of this up, and I think the demand will offset any decrease that we see. So that's some of the distressed liquidation I think that will offset. Now, this was a big one, the incentive to foreclose. Like, what incentive could you possibly have to foreclose? People forget about this. Back when the crash happened, they passed a law that said that any debt that's forgiven, you will not be taxed on. Why is that new? Well, people don't realize that if you have debt forgiven, so for instance, let's say in the 90s, if you foreclosed on a house, it was, you owed 500, it went to foreclosure and sold for 400, the bank lost $100,000. That doesn't just magically disappear. Legally, the person who owed that money would be taxed on it. The bank would submit essentially a 1099 loss and you would owe income tax on that amount. When they waived that back in the crash, it created this huge flood and change in mentality from buyers where you now had an incentive to foreclose because there was truly zero loss. You could walk, throw the keys back to the bank, wipe your hands clean, and move on. And there was no damage to anything other than your credit, which comes back and you're able to purchase again after five or seven years. So it changes um, qu quite a bit. That incentive is gone. 
Um, it, I mean, I guess theoretically it could come back, um, but that was a big one. We saw that change almost to the month when that gained attraction, um, it increased everything um, from, a, from a supply standpoint because everyone just said, I'm good, yep, not making payments on an interest only loan, so rent, throwing money out the window, on a house that's half the value I bought it for and I can essentially have zero recourse to toss the keys across the table. So that incentive um, increased demand dr or supply drastically. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but I don't think that's gonna, um, that's not gonna play a part this time because you don't have that incentive anymore. So what could change? So all of this is great, but there obviously are um, outside indicators and factors that would change my opinion on some of this. Unemployment, that's a big one. So if we get a market correction from an unemployment standpoint and you get these huge jumps in unemployed people, what you can and can't do in your mortgage is kind of irrelevant. If you have no money coming in, you can't make your payment. Um, you can't refinance. If the price goes down um, because you don't have the equity in it, um, you potentially could uh, modify it, but maybe not. Maybe the bank says, hey, I see $250,000 in equity. Maybe the demand drops off and you can't liquidate. So that is, an, that is a concern, right? If unemployment goes up and you can't make your payment, it doesn't really matter. Um, an inventory surge, um, that could happen. I don't think it's going to, but you have builders and investors um, both contributing to the inventory. So builders, from a single family standpoint, we're still high. We still have a lot of permits and under construction um, out there, um, but they're adjusting much quicker now. Um, their models, a lot of these models have changed to more of a contractor model where they don't have the employees, so they can just essentially not hire the contractor anymore. So they can come in and out of a, um, a supply standpoint by building or not building, put things on pause much faster than they could. But again, theoretically, they could just go gangbusters, build way too many houses, supply could hit, and then um, offset with low demand, and you could see prices decline. Investors, same way. I know I kind of touched about this in here um, with uh, investor demand and investor supply. So if they do have a huge dump, some of these uh, Wall Street investors who bought thousands of properties across the state of Arizona and across the country, obviously, um, they could liquidate. If they do, that would flood supply. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen. There's too much equity there. Um, besides the fact that they know that if they do it, they're gonna lose money and it's just a, uh, I have investment properties, so I understand the process of, of when you make that decision and when you don't. If you have a 2.5% interest rate, it's very, very difficult to justify liquidating. Um, uh, a demand crash. So a demand crash could come more if interest rates, for instance, spike. Let's say they go to 10, 12, something like that. Um, then you have a, uh, even if you do have this continued demand, um, it won't matter because you can't qualify. So it, it won't make a difference. So if that's the case, you could see demand crash, which would lower prices. Um, rental rates. So this is a big one. So as rental rates come down and interest rates go up, it becomes way more expensive to buy as the cost of rent comes down. So if you're in your rental and it's at $2,500 a month, you go to renew, you start looking around and realize the one across the street's $2,200 a month. And if you went to buy, maybe your mortgage was $3,500 a month. You're probably likely to move and save some money. And if these rental rates start coming down um, by quite a bit, it'll really decrease demand of who we thought might buy, which is a renter, um, and, and transition, because why would you buy, spend way more money when the cost of your um, uh, rent is actually decreasing? So we could see that, which would decrease demand even more. But again, even if we get all of this, um, I don't see us having a crash in 2008. I see us having a very slow decline over the next year at least. That's as far as out as I'm comfortable predicting. Um, so I think, Theoretically, in some areas, we'll probably see a decline of anywhere from five to 8% next year. Some will hold flat in the higher demand areas. Um, and I think you'll see some areas have even a little bit of appreciation. For instance, luxury. Luxury is holding very strong because a lot of those purchases are with cash. Cash doesn't care about interest rates. Um, if anything, it goes up because interest rates impact um, the stock market. So why have money in the stock market when you could offset it into an appreciating asset? So some of those things are, um, you know, they're moldable. If you have any suggestions or ideas or stats that you would like to share, I'm always open. Uh, but that is why I think this is not a 2008 crash. See you on the next one.